Today's video has been sponsored by our partners at The Sojourn to celebrate the release of the complete season 1. It contains all 12 episodes, including 3 brand new ones from volume 4 of this critically acclaimed audio drama, featuring a full voice cast including Martin Roach from The Expanse and Ben Prendergast from God of War Ragnarok and Apex Legends. The season is now available on all the big services including Audible, Spotify, Google Books and Apple Books and many more. Every episode is also available on the lowest tier of the Patreon linked below. And higher tiers get access to amazing bonus content including the visual dictionary, a ship identification chart by Star Trek Online's Thomas Morone, a hugely detailed ship cross-section poster, and 10 anthology shorts. If you don't know what the Sojourn is, then head over to their YouTube channel for free samples as well as extra lore content and ship breakdowns. The Sojourn, the complete first season, out now. Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hojiwana and today we're continuing our look at realistic spacecraft engines focusing on nuclear pulse propulsion, which you may know as the Orion Drive. Rather than using a big high-tech fusion machine with lasers or something, nuclear pulse propulsion started out being far more crude. You just ride the blast wave from a nuclear bomb, or rather many nuclear bombs. It all started out with Project Orion, which was a long-term study conducted by the United States Air Force, DARPA and NASA into the potential viability of using nuclear bombs as spacecraft propulsion. Their efforts were based on the work by Stanislaw Ulam and Frederick Rains in the late 1940s, with Project Orion itself formally beginning in 1958 under Ted Taylor and Freeman Dyson. As well as defining the propulsion technology itself, the project came up with a number of proposals for spacecraft, but more on those later. The basic concept of an explosion being able to move objects was fairly well proven by the 50s, but the idea of riding multiple explosions for thrust was confirmed with a model test using six chemical explosions. This was as far as any practical testing towards nuclear pulse propulsion went, though there is the event that occurred during the Pascal B test. Pascal B was an underground nuclear test with the bomb at the bottom of a big long shaft. The yield of Pascal A, the first test, was 50,000 times greater than anticipated, creating a huge spout of fire from the top of the borehole. To stop this happening for Pascal B, a 900 kg cap of steel armour plate was welded over the top of the hole. It did not stop the fire spout, and after the blast the steel cap was gone. Upon reviewing high-speed camera footage after the fact, the cap was seen in a single frame being fired off from the borehole at an estimated speed of over 66 kilometers per second. That is six times Earth's escape velocity, though the cap almost certainly burned up due to friction before leaving the atmosphere. So you can see why nuclear pulse propulsion was an exciting proposition. Now if you've watched our nuclear weapon video from last year, you'll know that nukes in space are a different beast to ones in atmosphere. Trying to ride the blast wave from a nuke is very difficult when there is no atmosphere to make one, and very wasteful because the blast is shaped like a sphere. You could be crazy and try to make a containment device for the nuclear blast, or you could do what Project Orion did and use a sort of nuclear shaped charge to focus the energy of the bomb into a small area. These pulse units used tungsten propellant that got turned into a plasma from the explosion, fired off at very high velocity towards the awaiting spacecraft. There's more info on how this happens in the nukes video. The way an Orion drive gets around being obliterated by this is a huge pusher place, a massive shield that takes the hit from the propellant. There's some funky stuff going on with plasma physics and thermal energy here that I'm not going to pretend to understand, but it means the plate gets shielded from most of the incredible heat in the plasma by the plasma. It doesn't stop all of it though, but even a tiny protective coating of oil can protect the pusher plate from being ablated. To protect the rest of the ship from the almighty slap that happens, there are multiple stages of shock absorption between the ship and the pusher plate. The first stage is on the pusher plate itself, and the second stage was made up of these big shock absorber tubes. Both of these bounce up and down in a sinusoidal pattern and smooth out the slap into a fairly consistent push. You'll also notice the shape of the drive above the pusher plate is conical, which is a necessity because of the hole in the plate that the bombs get launched through. Some of the propellant plasma will inevitably shoot back up this hole, so the conical shape is there so the blast wave washes over the drive. 
The downside is obviously the requirement to use nuclear bombs. Lots and lots of small nuclear bombs. Nuclear fallout and electromagnetic pulses are severe problems for atmospheric launches, but even in vacuum, the interaction between the products of nuclear blasts and the Earth's magnetosphere can create artificial radiation belts, just like the one that showed up after the Starfish Prime nuclear test in 1962, which caused at least nine satellites to fail. Relying on pulses also means fine manoeuvring is impossible as there's a minimum size of nuclear detonation. You can sort of throttle the drive by firing more or less pulses per unit time, but that's hardly ideal. Other problems include an awkward startup sequence where the shock absorbers must be set bouncing with a smaller charge, misfires can be highly dangerous to the shock absorbers and pusher plate, you can't vector the thrust for manoeuvring, and you can't use the drive to land on anything with an atmosphere. Why go through all this trouble and risk though? Well, as we can see from the Pascal B test, there's a very large amount of energy and thrust available to be harnessed. So much energy in fact that it ends up being the golden combination of high efficiency and high thrust. It can move absolutely huge payloads through space in short periods of time, or even get them off the ground and into space, or even send them to another star system. But these original nuclear pulse propulsion designs are the first pass versions of the technology. They are impressive, but crude and wasteful. For example, the size of the pusher plate is fairly small. Even with pulse units focusing the energy of the blast, there's still a lot of it going to waste. The Medusa variant uses a huge dome-shaped sail ahead of the spacecraft to catch the bomb's blast wave, grabbing more of that energy to transform into thrust. The shock gets absorbed by the cables being run out and then winched in, and as the structure is tensile it can be made much lighter, as I mentioned in that old ISV video. Subscribe now for a future video that covers the awesome ISV landing sequence in the way of water soonish. Another improvement that can be applied to either the pusher plate or Medusa cell is to attach electrical generators to the shock absorber system. This harvests only a small percentage of the energy from the bombs, but it's still enough to provide a significant amount of power to the spacecraft. This can be used in energy hungry equipment like radars and electrical weapons, essentially for free, at least when the drive is running. It also removes the problem of needing to use smaller bombs for the startup sequence on the pusher plate variant, as you can run the generators as motors to get the suspension in the right place. If you want some very in-depth information on this Moto Orion, then check out this link here. More modern pulse propulsion designs go even further towards remedying some of the problems with the Cold War concept. Antimatter catalyzed microfission takes aim at the minimum possible size of a traditional nuclear bomb by using antimatter to light off tiny pellets of nuclear fuel. This energy can be directed with either a magnetic nozzle for a reusable craft or an ablative one for a one-off, with shock absorbers smoothly transferring the bump to the rest of the craft. This removes the issue of using weaponizable nuclear bombs, but even the minuscule amount of antimatter required would be hideously expensive. If you don't have any antimatter to spare, you can instead use a large amount of electrical power. This is the core concept behind the Mini Mag Orion, which was an explicit attempt to update the concept. Rather than throwing out self-contained nuclear bombs, it uses a huge capacitor bank to zap its fuel pellets into exploding. That's the Mini and Orion parts of the name, with the mag being the magnetic nozzle that both directs the energy of the blast and charges up the capacitors using 1% of the power from the boom. The shock absorbers in this case are on the mag nozzle since it moves up and down. In both designs, radiation from the micro-nuclear explosions is still a major concern. It just can't be avoided when flying around using nuclear explosions. No matter the form factor, nuclear pulse propulsion has exceedingly impressive performance, so it's an attractive option for science sci-fi that wants to have highly capable engines. For example, the Messiah from Deep Impact had one, as did the USS George W. Bush from Iron Sky, though neither of them actually functioned that way. One of the best examples of a working one is Michael from Footfall. In real life, there's also been a number of mission concepts using the technology, most of which came directly from Project Orion, such as the 10 meter diameter design and its derivatives. As small nukes are harder to make, it's easier to scale Orion drives up than down, and so scale them up they did. General Atomics came up with a 4,000 ton spacecraft that would be launched aboard a gigantic chemical rocket to avoid all the nasty fallout problems. The Air Force were not terribly interested in the technology until seeing this thing, and at that point they were all in. They took the General Atomics design and armed it. A lot. They gave it three Mark 42 naval turrets, six close-in weapon systems, six hypersonic landing boats, and a number of space taxis. It also had the hundreds of nuclear pulse units it carried for propulsion, and a bunch of Kasaba howitzers based on them for some long-range nuclear spice. 
And to finish things up, it carried 500 re-entry vehicles armed with 20 megaton warheads. Just to clarify, this was a real design. This isn't a crazy sci-fi ship. The US Air Force actually wanted to build this and almost did before JFK cancelled the whole thing. And that was only the second most insane concept. I present to you the Doomsday Orion. Where the battleship had hundreds of nuclear weapons aboard, this had only one. It was one. An estimated yield for this thing puts it over 8 gigatons, which is so far removed from any practical experience with nuclear detonations that its effects are hard to pin down to anything specific beyond being apocalyptic. The Cold War certainly produced many crazy ideas, but there's just something special about nuclear pulse propulsion. It certainly has its drawbacks, but remains one of the most capable spacecraft propulsion methods ever designed. Thanks for watching! Don't forget to check out The Sojourn, the complete first season, and the extra content on their YouTube channel and Patreon. Links are below in the description and pinned comment. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.